Okay. Well, this morning we have a, a big task. Uh, pray that I can do it somewhat coherently or well. I've been working with this material for a year and a half. This is the, these are the galleys of my next book. It's, it took me longer to write this than any book because I, I, I kept saying that isn't making it clear as if I could finally make it clear. But I, I do want people to, uh, to recognize something that in fact is thoroughly biblical, uh, is found by regular little markings in the perennial tradition. But we have to admit was never the mainline tradition. So I can pretty much assume that yeah, what I'm going to try to say for most of you will sound very new and very different, even though it's entirely dogmatic. It really is. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, you know, sort of a subtext. And to put it in one phrase, deliberately shocking, uh, Christ is not Jesus' last name. And uh, we've sort of used it that way. We've so lumped them together uh, that uh, we don't realize we're talking about two different realities. I'm not saying they don't overlap. I'm not saying they don't come together. But uh, one reason we're facing the, the real impasse that Christianity is in right now in all of our denominational forms is that in the first 2,000 years after what we believe is the incarnation of God in Christ, we largely were overwhelmed by Jesus and trying to figure out who he was. Ironically, that's our gospel at today's Sunday Mass this afternoon. Who do you say that I am? Uh, but there's been not a lot of recognition of the Christ. And again, as I said, we so lumped them together and we lost the massive truth. In fact, what we lost was a basis for a universal religion, a natural religion, an inclusive religion. We ended up with an overly sentimental personal religion, which is what happens when you have Jesus without Christ. Why you can make him into a white man with blue eyes. And, uh, it's, there's, there's no corrective to that kind of silliness. And again, it's nobody's fault. Consciousness is unfolding. I, I know a lot of Christians were trained to think evolution is a bad word. In my vocabulary, it's the only thing that explains very much. That we're clearly unfolding. And the second coming of Christ is you. And the second coming of Christ is still happening. It's not one event, it's the rest of history. But uh, because we didn't understand the Christ, we didn't know how to think that way. So um, I, 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 I always like to put a really perfect frontispiece at the beginning of my books, something that sums it all up. And this time I had three of them, I couldn't decide between them, so I put all three of them. The first one is from Karl Rahner, the German Jesuit. The only really absolute mysteries in Christianity are the self-communication of God in the depths of existence. That's the soul. That's the true self, which we call grace. And in history, which we call Christ. Second, from St. John of Damascus, 7th century. I do not worship matter. He's a father of the church, if that means anything. I worship the God of matter, who became matter for my sake, and deigned to inhabit matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. I will not cease from honoring that matter which works for my salvation. This was the early period of the church when we were still recovering from the utter shock of the incarnation, that the word had become flesh. And remember in John's prologue, uh, in uh, John's first chapter, 
he, the word Jesus isn't used till the 17th verse, right at the end. He doesn't say the word became Jesus. He says the word became flesh. Now, the Eastern church developed that much more than the Western church. And we're, uh, for the most part, products of the Western church, you know, where we over-localized the incarnation in the body of Jesus and then felt we could or should or needed to prove that, which is unprovable. So it put us on the defensive or the offensive, however you want to see it, from the very beginning. Uh, the third frontispiece is from, of course, our supreme master of the 20th century for many of us, Thomas Merton. He ends, I think this is sign of Jonah. No despair of ours can alter the reality of things, nor stain the joy of the cosmic dance which is always there. So I believe the word Christ is one word, it's not the only word, but it works, if you can understand it correctly, for that cosmic dance. In many ways, if any of you, and you don't need to, I'm not here to push any of my books, if you read the divine dance on the Trinity, this book amounts to the sequel to that. First, we had to get the shape of God right, and that God is relationship, God is communion. God is not an old white man on a throne. Which, it's amazing how many even educated Christians still operate as if that's true. No wonder the Christian religion is falling apart. Huh? But once we get the shape of God right, then what's the shape of this manifestation of God that entered this world? So, as I think I mentioned yesterday, we can't presume that God just got interested in God's creation 2,000 years ago and left the first 13.7 billion years empty of revelation, empty of presence, empty of love, empty of communion. That the poor Stone Age people and the Mayans and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Bushmen of Africa were, were, did not have access to God. Of course they did. God isn't playing hide and seek. But we found uh, in our overemphasizing Jesus without understanding Christ, we created a storyline. Uh, I'm making a caricature, forgive me. But that all depends upon a supposed sin that was committed between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Um, and, and <laughs> that just isn't a big enough storyline for, you know, they're now saying when I was in college, there were six stars for each one of us. Now it's six galaxies. Did you hear that? I don't know if it's true, but i just reading books like you're reading books. Six galaxies <laughs> for each human being. You have to say, who is God? Oh, and well, he certainly isn't upset because someone bit into an apple. You understand? But uh, I understand how you have to teach the mythic stories, but most people don't know how to understand sacred texts. They really don't. It's not their fault. Uh, they just weren't made ready for it. So um, the Christ existed from all eternity. Now let me give you my definition of Christ. One of you rightly asked me yesterday, where did the word come from? Well, Christ is the Greek for the Hebrew word for anointed, mesach means to pour oil on something, which is to recognize its, its inner soul, its inner spirituality. So an anointed anything was a sacred. But to recognize that sacredness, the ritual in a number of native religions was to pour holy oil, to anoint them. The word mesach in Hebrew became Messiah, uh, became the Christ, which means simply anointed in, in Greek. But we lumped it all together and, and laid it on the person of Jesus before we understood the concept itself, what it's saying. So let me give you, I hope not, my not too simplistic, definition of Christ, the Christ mystery. 
as Paul rightly called. Paul still gets this, whether you know it or not. He really does. Paul is a mystic of the first magnitude, which is why we often didn't understand him. Uh, but the Christ mystery is whenever matter and spirit are operating as one. There it is. That's it. That's it. Now that starts at what, and you're the first generation that ever had a word for this at the moment of the Big Bang. Didn't start 2,000 years ago. God started manifesting the God self. The infinite eternal life of the Trinity outflowed and manifested itself in everything visible your eyes have ever seen. What else could it be but the body of God? I mean, just use your Christian common sense. What else could it be? Where did this all come from? But you'll find that much more clearly represented in earlier mystical teachings. Or my own father, St. Francis, who's the first recorded person to speak of brother, sun, sister, moon, sister, fire, brother, water. It's all sacred. It's one sacred ecosystem. And it isn't divided into the sacred and the secular. Once you get into dividing as if it's up to you, to decide where the Christ is and where the Christ isn't. We lose every time. That's why we have racism. That's why we have homophobia. That's why we have sexism and classism and all the other silliness. Is the ego has taken upon itself to decide what is sacred. No, it's all sacred. And, and the, the true mystic uh, wants to kneel and kiss the ground every day. He lives, she lives in a sacred universe. So the title I'm pushing for, the publishers are still, and Ben are still arguing about this week by week. This is a better title, this is a better title. But my preferred one is another name for every thing, every and thing being separated. And the subtitle being the universal Christ. Now, did I forget my Bible? Typical Catholic. I did. I thought did I, I, I left it in my room. Darn it! One of you good evangelicals has a Bible, don't you? Uh, if you don't, I won't feel so guilty. <laughs> well, I'll, no, no, it's okay. You know, well, yeah, Colossians one, the hymn. I was just going to quote the hymn in Colossians, or the hymn in Ephesians. I know. Let, let's try Ephesians. Ephesians one three. You were chosen in Christ from the very beginning. You were chosen in Christ. The problem is solved. There's not an apple problem to be solved later by an atonement theory. I hesitate to raise that word because I know you're going to ask me about it. But the atonement theory was a rather late creation. We Franciscans never believed it. And those of you who were raised evangelical, it's one of your four pillars you don't even realize it's, it doesn't stand the test of time, you know? It's a problem-solving technique to a problem that we created, you know what I'm And creates a, a father God who is pissed off at humanity and needs to be bought off to love us, which contradicts the nature of love, certainly of infinite love. So you'll probably get me back to that, and I know I made a mistake by introducing the idea already. But I have to say it. Now, our theory of salvation is so tiny, so planet-bound. Uh, it's, you know, as, as you said so well yesterday, you know, Jackie, uh, when we discover life on another planet, which might be tomorrow, our little storyline is shot to hell. <laughs> I mean, if you think the Christian religion is falling apart now, <laughs> wait till we find life on another planet, you know? And what, what happens? It's just the whole thing is incomprehensible. So our narrative was, was not a creation-based spirituality, all right? It was a, what we call fall redemption spirituality. It was Matthew Fox who came to visit me two weeks ago who first introduced that vocabulary, huh? 
Fall redemption spirituality is what almost all of you in this room, Catholic, Protestant, or anywhere in between, were raised in. You create the problem, and then you say, well, we have an answer to the problem instead of teaching you how to be contemplative and see the sacred in everything all the time, everywhere. That's spiritual seeing. So you see why at our school and at our center, the teaching of contemplation is, is the underlying epistemology. It, it, it's it's the, what we begin everything with because we don't want to teach people what to see. We want to teach people how to see. And how, when you teach people how to see, they will recognize the Christ. I'm going to read to you um, from the preface of the book uh, from uh, the journal of an English woman, Carol Hauslander, rather unknown, uh, in her autobiography called A Rocking Horse Catholic. She was like most Catholics are, you know, how do you survive amidst so many contradictions? Uh, she describes three spiritual experiences she had in her life. I want to read one of them for you. It almost perfectly parallels Thomas Merton's experience on 6th and Walnut in Louisville, Kentucky. I was in an underground train, a crowded train in which all sorts of people jostled together, sitting and strap hanging, workers of every description going home at the end of the day. Quite suddenly, I saw with my mind, but as vividly as a wonderful picture, Christ in all of them. But I saw more than that. Not only was Christ in every single one of them, living in them, dying in them, rejoicing in them, sorrowing in them, but because he was in them and because they were here, the whole world was here too. That's what every mystic sees. They might not describe it with the clarity that she does here. That's the great intuitive knowing. That's the mind of Christ. In fact, after writing this book, my definition of a Christian, and it's going to sound almost naive to most of you, a Christian is one who sees Christ everywhere else. That's it. <laughs> when you can't, you, that's it. It's not believing in dogmas or going to church or following some moral commandment, back to her text. He was in them. And because they were here, the whole world was here too. Here in this underground train. Not only the world as it was at that moment, not only all the people in all the countries of the world, but all those people who had lived in the past and all those yet to come. Mystic means to see in holes instead of parts. Remember yesterday I said, when, what makes something pornographic is to just see part of it. I came out into the street and I walked for a long time in the crowds of London. It was the same here, on every side, in every passerby, everywhere, Christ. I had been long haunted by the Russian conception of the humiliated Christ, the lame Christ, limping through Russia, begging his bread. The Christ who all through the ages might return to the earth and come even to sinners to win their compassion by his need. Do you hear what she just said? I, <laughs> that God is begging for our compassion. It's just, uh, you know who else says that is that wonderful Jewish woman, um, Eddie Hillison. Uh, if you want to read a book that can change your life, particularly if you're a woman, uh, Eddie Hillison, An Interrupted Life. Uh, she's more Christian than most Christians I've ever met. And she dies in Auschwitz, uh, a very transformed Jewish woman. And she has, you know, God begging for our compassion. I thought we begged for God's compassion. Can you turn that around? That's the amazing thing mystics are able to do. Now in the flash of a second, I knew that this dream is a fact, not a dream, 
not the fantasy or legend of a devout people, not the prerogative of the Russians, but Christ in everyone. I saw too the reverence that everyone must have for a sinner. Instead of condoning his sin, which is in re reality his utmost sorrow, one must comfort Christ who is suffering in him. Talk about the divine pity, <coughs> universal compassion. A sinner is someone whom Christ is suffering in. And this reverence must be paid even to those sinners whose souls seem to be dead. Because it is Christ who is the life of the soul who is dead in him. They are his tombs. Have you ever gone to Mexico? Or in fact, uh, today's the Mexican Independence Day. Uh, the churches in Mexico or Latin America where, uh, and I'm sure if you were raised Protestant, it's a rather ghastly image, but they have this image of the dead Christ laying in the tomb under the altar. Uh, she understood that. that we needed to picture the dead Christ because the sinner is still Christ. You understand? It's just Christ in the tomb, but it's still Christ. Can you make that switch? Huh? It's all Christ. And it takes away from you the, the power to judge where the Christ is. The Christ, and this is my big point, is a universal notion. Christ is everywhere. In him, every kind of life has meaning. And I'm going to call Christ, uh, you'll help me unpackage this, I hope, the life principle of everything. Everything. Visible. Material. And Jesus is the death principle. He, he came to reveal, you know, the only way you can come to this life is by incorporating death. Damn it. That's our pushback against Jesus, the folly of the cross. When you can hold the life principle and the death principle together, Jesus and Christ, you've got the full Paschal mystery. You've got the full revelation. It is not the foolish sinner like myself running about the world with reprobates and feeling magnanimous who comes closest to them and brings them healing. It is the contemplative in her cell who has never set eyes on them but in whom Christ fasts and prays for them. It may be a charwoman in whom Christ makes himself a servant again or a king whose crown of gold hides a crown of thorns. Realization of our oneness in Christ is the only cure for human loneliness. Remember when we set you out yesterday, we said, once the Christ presence, I didn't put it that way then, is revealed in everything that lives, you can never be lonely again. For me too, it is the only ultimate meaning of life. The only thing that gives meaning and purpose to every life. This is a universal religion. Can you follow me? It's a natural religion. It doesn't depend on the Bible. I don't mean to put down the Bible, but let's, let's be honest. Right? In terms of geological time, the Bible has existed in the last nanosecond of time and was made highly printable only in the last 500 years. Don't hate us Catholics too much. It's just for 1,500 years we couldn't read or write, you know? So we drew pictures. You artists will understand that. And we created stained glass windows in cathedrals. We created beauty because we didn't know how to read or write. You who were raised in the Protestant tradition, God bless you, you were coterminous with the invention of the printing press. But the trouble is, you dove into it <laughs> with total abandon, and you stopped looking at reality, you stopped looking at the trees, brother, sun, sister, moon, and you just read words, words, words. And the word had become flesh. I say, the Christ was coming down the up escalator, and, and we were rushing up. Her final paragraph. After a few days, the vision faded. People looked the same again. Merton says the same thing about his sixth and walnut 
It's now Muhammad Ali Avenue in Louisville. People look the same again. There was no longer the same shock of insight for me each time. I was face to face with just another human being. Christ was hidden again. Indeed, though the years to come, I would have to seek for him, and usually I could find him in others, and still more in myself. But it was on, only through a deliberate and blind act of faith. Many of the mystics speak of your whole life being remembering in the darkness what you once experienced in the light. Now, people who've never had a moment of light, a moment of enlightenment, a moment of presence, a moment of awareness, they don't know what to look for. It's not their fault. They still feel as a, they're, they're a solitude in this universe. So let me say, and I say it throughout the book, I'm not trying to lay the Christian religion on anybody. Uh -huh. In fact, quite the contrary. Now, in fact, you'll find, once you recognize the universal nation, nature of the Christ mystery, my God, a lot of the New Testament is saying this very well, very well. But it isn't in competition with Judaism anymore. In fact, it entirely builds on it and recognizes Judaism as our parent religion. <laughs> and just as we Catholics can't hate Judaism, Protestantism can't hate Catholicism, neither of us can hate Judaism or the native religions, we're all building on one another. And the building is an expansion of seeing what we are calling the Christ. But you don't need to call it Christ to have the recognition. You follow me? I'm not tied to that word in the least. And considering what we've done to the word or with the word, where it's just, it's lethal right now, you know? People are so tired of people with tracks laying a trip on them. It's just, you wonder why they even put up with this. Uh, you know, Karl Rahner, that same German Jesuit, he said in the early 60s, he was one of my five great teachers. Don't ask me who the other four were, but I just... Uh, uh, he said, I would recommend that for 50 years we stop using the word God and just speak of the holy mystery because we don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> and if that's true of, of God, I, I want to add to that, I think that's true of Jesus and Christ. We use the word so glibly, so quickly, and then we lump them together. If you read Paul's letters, even in his seven unquestioned authentic letters, he uses one phrase more than any other. It's his shortcut phrase, like on your computer, when you want to get to it real quickly, you uh, click the little shortcut, his shortcut phrase for almost everything he's saying is two Greek words, en Christo, in Christ, in Christ. Now, you just make the transition. He's talking about Jesus. No, he's talking about Christ. Do you know in all of his letters, he only uses the word Jesus independently five times? And two of them are in the hymn of Philippians, which he didn't write. So you can say three times, Paul never knew Jesus. <laughs> Hardly ever quotes Jesus. Aren't you shocked by that? <laughs> and when he does quote him, it's usually incorrectly, at least if we're to believe the four Gospels. Huh? Now, real quickly, and you can bring me back to this. In general, the three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are about Jesus. John is about Christ. And the reason we have so misused and misinterpreted John's gospel is this is the eternal archetypal Christ talking. He can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he's not talking about Jesus. He's talking about this mystery, this amalgam of matter and spirit, which is the way for everybody that you discover spirit in this material universe. That was true for the native religions, was true for Judaism, 
It was certainly apparent in Hinduism, if you've ever been to India, where gods are everywhere. The sacred is everywhere. They're always anointing everything, especially the male and female genitals, even in the temples. It's all sacred. It's sort of shocking for us prudish Christians. Uh, this is sacred too, you know. It's all one sacred universe. But we got a lot of unlearning to do. And that's why we teach contemplation, because contemplation is mostly unlearning. So he uses the phrase en Christo 164 times in his authentic letters. It's hands down. And he thinks we know what he's talking about. It's his code word for what I'm trying to tell you now. It's a participatory experience. Christ is not an individual. Christ is a collective. It's, it's his word for oneness. Stay with me. It's his word for, for unity. It's his word for, for the social order. It's his word for that God is saving the whole. We are saved in Christ from the beginning. Please go back and read the first chapter of Ephesians. You say, how did Ephesians and Colossians, we think were written maybe in the 70s. Probably not. They're not the authentic Paul letters. Maybe the students of Paul are the school of Paul. They're influenced by Paul, but it's a different use of the Greek, different way of talking. But how already by the 70s, Jesus has been dead only 40 years, have they come to this massive, cosmological understanding of their religion. It was a universal religion. That's by the year 106, and I'm not saying this to push Catholicism, but that's where we started using the word Catholic, 106, because they saw when Ignatius of Antioch was traveling from Antioch in Syria to be killed in Rome, he's being led in chains across Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, and in village after village, he's already seeing Christians, 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 Christians. You know, they're doing great sociological studies now. Why did that first generation succeed so well uh, and so quickly? Uh, was it the Holy Spirit was more active in those days? I believe this analysis. I believe that the authentic preaching of the gospel contrary to what the evangelical pastors are saying right now. So returned social dignity and social equality to the human race that, you know, eight out of 10 people in the Roman Empire were slaves. Women were chattel. And when the first preachers, Paul himself, come along and talk about you are the temple of God, that's... According to N.T. Wright, that is Paul's supreme idea. That the new temple is the human person. Once you hear it, you go back and read Paul. It's everywhere. The new temple, he has what I called earlier a very positive anthropology. Maybe no one gave you the eyes to see that. But it's all the way through. He doesn't just have a positive salvation theory as we had but a positive image of the human person as the image of God. Where did he learn that? From his Jewish religion. Genesis 1, 26, 27, let us create, which as I point out in the divine dance, even to our Jewish ancestors, it was a bit of a problematic. Why is a plural pronoun used? Is God talking to God's self? Let us create in our image. Two plural pronouns, as if God is a communion, and we are created in that living image of communion. You are not your own. You are inherently connected. You are inherently one. You are more one than many. Now, in Corinthians, he takes that to his doctrine of the body of Christ. In the first uh, 1,200 years of Christianity, the true body of Christ this reflects Catholic theology, but you'll understand it, was you, the people of God. And the, the mystical body was the bread and the wine, which is the next chapter in, in 1 Corinthians. You know? So incarnation goes all the way through uh, 
reality, all the way to the basic elements of bread and wine. That this whole elemental world is Christified, is, is christened, if you will. That's a very, very different worldview. After the 13th century, and this is our mistake, and one good reason why you reacted against us, uh, we made the bread and the wine the true body of Christ. You'll have Catholics that, you know, worship the bread and the wine but hate their neighbor. <laughs> and the mystical body of Christ, the sort of body of Christ, is you. And that's the worldview we all have today, you know. You are not objectively, inherently the body of Christ. It's something you have to uh, achieve by answering an altar call at a prayer meeting on Friday night in Baltimore. Do you understand? It, it, it isn't inherent, which makes your, your, your identity very unstable, which is why people grab onto such unstable things for identity, like race and gender and skin color and cl social class and what car you drive. And all they have is the false self. If, if there's one major failure to Christianity, we have not communicated the gospel. Uh, and the only thing worthy of being called good news is that you are objectively the children of God. Not subjectively, not psychologically, ontologically. Got it? Now that was called theosis in the Eastern Church, or divinization. The Western Church never directly taught theosis or divinization. You have to go to all the Eastern Fathers, where then it was taken for granted, uh, where it was assumed that your identity was inherent, not attained, not achieved, uncreated grace, they called it, which all grace is, or it wouldn't be grace, as Paul says in Ephesians. This is, if you're, if you're connecting the dots, this, this changes everything, all right? All of our competing and comparing and, and judging, it just takes away all your power to judge. You're, you're supposed to be feeling real powerless right now, all right? In a good way. There's good powerlessness and there's bad powerlessness. But this is a good powerlessness. You know? <laughs> that you're, you're no longer in control of defining who's in and who's out because we're all in. Now, the dualistic mind of the West, oh God, this leads to so many things. That I want to give you as much as I can, but uh, we, didn't, we didn't have that big field. And so we understood, as the dualistic mind does, almost the entire gospel in terms of, of a win-lose paradigm. It's called a zero-sum game. In a zero-sum game, someone has to lose for you to win. That's the way you basically define your winning. He's showing who the losers are. Ferreting out sinners. Huh? The wonderful thing about Jesus, check me out on this. And it's almost scandalous when, when we first discover it. Jesus is not upset at sinners. He isn't. Dang it. We sure are. He's upset at people who don't think they're sinners. You check me out on that. You show me one sinner that he ever punishes. He's not into retribution. He's not into win-lose. I've told this story for years, uh, but it was true when I was still in Cincinnati as a young priest. I was invited to speak at a Catholic businessman's breakfast. And I said to this group of very successful Catholic businessmen, all threes on the anagram, I'm sure. And um, uh, I said, what if the gospel is win-win? And I could tell I was getting no receptivity. I don't know how I unpackaged it, but, but I backed off real quick. They didn't. And, <laughs> As you learn to do when you're preaching the gospel to an unevangelized people, you know, like what you, you heard last night in, uh, uh, you know, Martin Luther King's letter to the clergymen, to the bishops. I was so ashamed to see bishops sign that original letter. I didn't know that. 
But uh, anyway, they uh, resisted me, I could tell, so I changed the subject. I wasn't getting anywhere. But at the break, this successful white businessman comes up and thumbs his fingers on the podium and says, Father, Father, in a very patronizing way, as Catholics want to do when they want to be back in control, Father, Father. He says, when, when, that wouldn't even be interesting. That's a quote. That's the way white religion thinks. It wouldn't even be, it's not interesting. If you want to fill a stadium, if you want to build a stadium, you've got to create a win-lose worldview. That's why people love sports. Thank God for sports. I mean, really, not against sports. It tames the war instinct, and at least we can think it really, <laughs> really it does. We can think it really matters whether the Cardinals or the Yankees win or whatever, you know. Um, it doesn't really matter in the great scheme of things, but it tames that win-lose instinct. Can you really allow your worldview to be changed to win-win? I'm, I don't think it's the gospel until you can. And, and in that sense, most of the Western church has yet to be evangelized. It doesn't know the gospel. It's playing a zero-sum game. And, and you see it even over the beautiful European cathedrals. I was just preaching over there in much of July. And over the entranceway, there's the Christ as a white man sitting on the throne, damning half of the group to hell and inviting the other half to heaven. And I know it's Matthew 25, and I'd be happy to try to explain Matthew 25. But you know, Jesus, clearly, most common metaphor for eternal life is a wedding banquet. Only, the only courtroom scene is Matthew 25. And that's about how we treat the poor. And wouldn't you know it, that's our preferred metaphor. You know? We don't like wedding banquets that much, where the good and bad alike are included. <laughs> We've got all kind of excuses why not to come. That still continues. It's so clear once you see it. Um, now, before I open this up to discussion, we're, we've already got the convention center reserved for next March when this book is going to come out. But the reason we're running the, running the convention center is not because of me, but because of John Dominic Crossan, who this is his latest book. And Jackie will be our third presenter in March. Uh, I was at, what was it, the fourth iteration of this book, or fifth, or sixth, I don't know. I did eight. I've never done eight iterations of any book. Usually I just write them and send them to the publisher which shows in the final editing. <laughs> but um, anyway, I thought, okay, it's off to the publisher. Now I can forget about it. Uh, and then uh, a friend, uh, a friend who's rather knowledgeable and knew what I would like, sent me this book. It's called Resurrecting Easter. How the West lost and the East kept the original Easter vision. It's especially exciting to give this because I know there's so many artists in this room. And what I said about Catholicism applies here. You know, um, you can really pretty much tell what people really believe by their art. <laughs> art reveals our real theology. And he makes this quote it makes this idea very clear in this book. Here it is in a word. This particular cover is the Korah Church in Istanbul. Maybe some of you have been there. It's still there. Right? And it's considered the classic archetypal painting of the understanding of the resurrection. But let me give you a little bit of history. Again, remember the Eastern Church understood the Christ equally with Jesus. Not just Jesus, apart from Christ which is what you were given. We find no attempts to paint the resurrection for six centuries. In fact, we're now assuming there must have been some canonical regulation or guideline that you don't paint the resurrection. Why is that? Because it's a collective universal mystery, and once you circumscribe it in one body, do you understand? You, it's not the resurrection anymore. 
I remember asking my professor in systematic theology in the late 60s, if there had been a camera present at the resurrection, what would it have seen? He said, here's my suspicion. It certainly was not a triumphant little Jesus coming out of a tomb, like, like we're <laughs> raised to think. Look at me, you know. It's, <laughs> we call it touchdown Jesus, you know. It's a, <laughs> I made a touchdown, I rose. And then we have to prove that he rose, you know, which you can't do again. Uh, but most Eastern art, I just will we'll explain this, but this is Eastern art. It's always a collective notion, which uh, this is Western art. First, we didn't paint it at all, which was good. When we started painting it, the Eastern church painted it in a completely different way that has persisted till this time. Just go to any Orthodox church. You'll see some formulation of this. I'll explain it in a middle. Uh, we don't paint the resurrection very much at all, actually. There's a lot more paintings of Bethlehem and the crucifixion. I think it's because we didn't get the resurrection. I asked a, a recent crowd, how many Christmas songs do you know? Well, we all know 30,000, you know? How many Easter songs do we know? Oh, Jesus Christ has risen today. That's the only one, <laughs> the only one Catholics know. Uh, it, it wasn't a big celebration because we didn't get the mystery. That's my assumption. That's my, my attempt to, to understand what he is saying here. So when they did start painting it in the East, we always have, and it's based on those several obscure passages in the Pauline letters where it talks about him descending in and bringing prisoners back. It's only two or three different passages. Uh, we put it in the uh, creed as Jesus descended into hell. But he's always shown, I'm sorry this painting is not fully visible on the cover, but you'll, you'll follow me. There's about 65 different formulations of it inside the book. You have Christ coming out of a deep pit that is called Hades. A figure is bound at the bottom of the pit down here. There's locks and chains flying in all directions. This is found in almost every Eastern Orthodox painting. He is trampling the gates of hell. Darn, I should have made sure I, I brought a better image. But it, take, take my word, and I'll leave this book here. He's trampling on the gates of hell. He undid hell, right? And he's pulling Adam and Eve, the archetypal symbols of all of humanity, out of hell. And I want you to compare that to the Sistine Chapel in Rome where we elect our pope, huh? where he's condemning people to hell. The Eastern understanding of the resurrection is the liberation, the undoing of hell. It doesn't exist anymore. That's why they're much more excited. We don't have anything to be excited about. On <laughs> yeah, because it's all just proving something we can't prove, that we felt we had to prove Jesus rose from the dead, which you cannot do. And, and, but it's not a message about you. You know, we human beings are so narcissistic. Me too, we all are that we aren't interested in things that don't include us. I mean that. You just don't take a fancy to things if you're not somehow a part of the narrative. That's that whole discussion on pronouns that we got into right at the beginning. We want we language and yet who's the we? Uh, when we don't feel we're a part of the we, we lose interest, don't we? We all do. And that's understandable. But I think we lost interest <laughs> in the Christian message because it did it wasn't inclusive it wasn't universal it really wasn't joyful it was still a contest and what we were supposed to do is get excited about football Jesus or touchdown Jesus look at me you go look go to google right now if you've got it there and images of the resurrection, right? Every Eastern image is a lone man stepping out of a tomb. He's normally holding a flag, which has no message on it because we didn't know the message. Really, it's an empty white flag. I guess it's surrender, I don't know if white always meant surrender. Uh, sometimes there's two stunned guards over here. Sometimes there's three angels smiling over here. 
Uh, but it's all about, I did it. Worship me. You follow? And I'm all for worshiping Jesus, although he never told us to do that. He told us to follow him, not to worship him. But it's much easier to worship someone than to follow them, at least when you teach like Jesus did. So anyway, uh, I, I could not put this book down. I just, I, I was breathless by the time I got to the end of it. On the very last page, after giving you 65 examples, he takes you, John Dominic Crossan is, is a bit of a genius. He takes you to Red Square in Russia, Moscow, where all the tanks are parading around and all the uh, soldiers marching. He said hardly anybody knows that over in a corner of Red Square, he circles it, is one remaining icon. In this atheistic, supposedly atheistic country, one piece of art was never destroyed. And it's this same icon of the risen Christ. He said he is still facing, of course, the Christ is beyond gender, which, which solves our gender problems too, I hope. Um, still facing the armaments of empire and war. And that they haven't to torn it down is sort of unbelievable. So if you ever go to Moscow Red Square, look for the icon of the risen Christ. It's the only piece of art in the whole square, he says. So I just, I was, I was breathless. It was just so compelling as I turned each page of the book and recognized, yeah, we don't get it. We've never got it. His subtitle, How the West Lost and the East Kept, the original Easter vision. So I uh, tracked down John Dominic Crossan's email, emailed, and I said, I, you probably don't know who I am. I said, but I've been a fan of yours all my life. You're a scholar of the first magnitude. Would you in any way be interested in joining me next spring? Because I'm going to try to communicate the cosmic Christ, which is the, the risen Christ and the cosmic Christ are the same thing. And the metaphor is light. He became light. The first thing created on the first day. Uh, and light is ubiquitous. It's universally available. There's no Catholic light. There's no Methodist light. There, there's no Hindu light. There's no gay light. There's just light. And light is not something you see. It's that by which you see everything else. Huh? So to be enlightened is to be able to see everything else with depth and with clarity. Within an hour, I got an email back. I'll be there. You give me the date. So uh, I'm going to try to communicate. There I'll have much longer. I only have an hour with you. But uh, communicate this message. Oh, here, that's right. This is a little bigger picture of it. You can see trampling on the gates of hell. See the locks and the chains and the keys flying all directions. See Hades imprisoned there at the bottom see him pulling Adam and Eve and he's never a lone figure he's always a collective there's always people as you see here on each side of him Our, the biggest single heresy of western Christianity is that we individualize the whole message we individualize sin and salvation and for me this was the clincher that proved that we never understood it. We never got it. And that's why we're not that excited about it. So I love, and I'm so excited to tell this to a group of creative people like you. Because we've got to find some way to communicate this through art and poetry and music, which is the much better way of, of learning. One interesting thing, you'll see it when you, you go through the many paintings. It's called, I'm sure they didn't have that meaning to it, the limp-wristed Adam and Eve. In, in every painting, Adam and Eve are not grasping for Jesus' hand. They're just handing out a, a limp wrist. And this is in every single painting. It's that we're being drug out almost in spite of ourselves. Do you understand? We don't even know we need salvation. Huh? It's being done to us. Now, before people were literate and could read and write, 
They saw every aspect of a painting like that. They studied it from top to bottom. We don't do that anymore. We just barely look at it. Huh? But imagine if you couldn't read or write. That's what, why I know when you go to Italy and Catholic countries, it's just art, 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 top to bottom ceiling. You get sick of it in Italy, at least I do. Uh, but once you understand, this was the way they understood through art. Not through the written word because they couldn't read or write. The word had become flesh for them in a different way. So I know I'm missing a lot of major points, but let me stop at that so you can ask a few questions. Because the implications of this socially, politically, ecclesially, um, I, it gives us something really good to build on. Something you don't have to apologize for. And I think we're all in a, a period of immense apology for the Christian religion, for how it allowed itself to be co-opted by the slaveholders and, and the apartheid people. Maybe this crisis now is going to force us to finally own our shadow, which religion has never been very good at. Do you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you might know something that I don't, but I'm told the only two countries that ever collectively own their shadow, their corporate sin, are Germany and South Africa. The only two. Every other nation, including ours. When you try to own the shadow of America, I get hate letters. Don't give me that revisionist history. That's the word they use. Not realizing the history we were given was the revisionist history. Never occurs to them. They're, they're sincere people. But yeah, any interpretation rather than the imperial one is revisionist history. This Christ is not able to be co-opted by empire nearly as easily. It's an archetypal image. It's a universal image. It's a cosmic image. It's, it's connected to creation, not to a storyline in Israel. And that was the breaking point with, with Judaism, that Paul, as much as he loved his Jewish religion and built on it and respected it, he felt it was too tied to ethnicity. And so many Jewish people recognize that today. That if it's God's work, it can't be tied, as you said so well, uh, to one person, one race being chosen. He says in Romans 11, the chosenness of my people was so that they could communicate chosenness to everybody else. And when they don't communicate chosenness to everybody else, he says they're not keeping the covenant. And that was the breaking point, you know, sad to say. The, the sad thing is, the wonderful thing is, many Jewish people recognize this better than we do. 